Good morning, Elm Street congregation. My name is Reverend Catherine Light, and I'm so glad that you are here with me this morning. It is July 26, 2020. Wow, we are over halfway through. I want to welcome everyone to this morning's service and ask you when you come in to please sign in. And um, we have just a couple announcements today. The first announcement is that for those of you participating in the white privilege course, just remember it starts, uh, the, the uh, tomorrow session begins at 630 and I will be emailing out your Zoom links. This is the same link as last time. So if you have that, you're fine. If not, I'll send you a new one. And Tuesday, we're continuing with the David and Jonathan story. So that's all I have for announcements this morning. Um, let's begin with our call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works, glory is his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful work he has done, his miracles and his judgments he's uttered, of offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Good morning. I see a lot of people signing in. Good morning, good morning. That's so nice to see that. Okay, sisters and brothers, God never forgets God's promises. God's covenant endures in each new generation. We are free to speak the truth about our lives because God's faithfulness embraces us as we examine our hearts. <clears throat> We imagine that we are capable judges of power and wisdom and goodness, and we trust our own standards. We separate and categorize. We mark the performance of others. We fail to trust your power, O oh God. Hidden in all things, we fail to watch for you, working out your purposes. Gracious God, hidden and manifest, transformed our withered imaginations until we yield the judgments we trust to love we cannot control amen so brothers and sisters those among us today what are we then to say about god other than that he forgets us that we are forgiven amen So as our tradition in regular worship is we have offering, and of course you can't send it through the computer, at least not yet. I mean, you can the donate button, but we uh, have our offering that is mailed, that you have mailed into us during the week. And uh, the call of the offering is the Apostle Paul promises all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. We trust that God will bring forth good from which we offer today. It is our privilege to participate in the unfolding of God's grace in the world. Let us give with grateful and expectant hearts. So this, this is our gathering this morning. Uh, Holy One, receive these offerings as you receive our lives. Gather our false starts and uncertain efforts, our generosity and our reluctance. Enliven us with your breath and make your purpose known that our lives might show forth your glory. For we pray in the name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. We have two scriptures today. I thought I would read both the Romans and the Matthew text. I'm going to preach on the Matthew text, but the Romans one is important too. I think that we should hear it. It's Romans 8, uh, verses 26 to 29, 39. Likewise, the Spirit helps in, us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. 
and God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he uh, foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all, while he not with him also gave us everything else. Who will bring any charge against God, God's elect? It is God who justifies. God who is, who, who is to condemn. If It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who was at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ, will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it was written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to the slaughter. No, in these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. And the Matthew text. He put forth another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and has become a tree. So when the birds of the air come to make nests in its branches, so, so that the birds of air can come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field that was someone found and hid, then in his joy goes and sells all he has to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in the search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore and sat down and put the good, the good into baskets and threw out the bad. So it is at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a household who brings out his treasure, what is old, what is new, and what is old. Let us pray for illumination this morning. Spirit of life, we do not know how to pray as we ought. Meet us in words written and words spoken. Intercede for us with signs too deep for words until we shine with the hope that is hidden in our hearts. For we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I can't see in my glasses. We'll fix that. All right. So for the sermon this morning, we are going to look at that Matthew text, the first part of it, not the last part. Um, and think about, uh, in this text, Jesus is talking to his disciples. They are all Jewish, but they live under the power of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was huge. It went into North Africa. It went all the way to Hadrian's Wall in England. It went all the way to Constantinople in the east. It was a huge empire. But it was corrupt, right? And it didn't treat people very well. And there was all kinds of horrible things that happened under the auspice of Rome. Well, our society is like Rome. We live in a new Rome, and just like Rome, our society values all the wrong things. Money and prestige, inequity, privilege, stuff, and more stuff, and more stuff stuff. 
A person's value in our society is directly related to her, his or her possessions and their possessions that we have denotes our power and place in the world and our world is corrupt. We do not care for the widow or the orphan. We leave people, including our veterans, burdened with PTSD and substance abuse. We live in squalor and poverty, and poverty breeds disease and sickness. We cage children, separating even infants from their mothers. Our cruelness knows no bounds. We send our poorest and most vulnerable members of our society to work as essential workers for minimum wage so that we can hide in our homes safe away from coronavirus while they work without health insurance. We turn our eyes away from the atrocities being perpetrated in our name with our consent when men and women of color are gunned down and strangled and beaten and have the life choked out of them while we watch, searching for reasons to justify the unjustifiable. Our world is broken. And our Rome, like the Rome of old, seeks to co-op our faith and subdue it <clears throat> so that it is no longer a threat to Rome's own existence. So instead of fighting injustice, Instead of providing for the needy, instead of living the Beatitudes, we embrace inequity under the myth of meritocracy. We blame the poor for being poor and we shun the Beatitudes in favor of profit and comfortableness. We trade the morals and ethics of Christ for the morals and ethics of Rome. We allow ourselves to be seduced by the world. Slowly the teachings of Jesus are eroded until we give only lip service to his name by claiming a faith with no commission and no teeth who benefits can only be realized once we are dead. We are bombarded with slogans that produce fear, that cultivate hatred and breed suspicion so that even when we remember the Beatitudes we qualify the message through the acceptable ethos, ethos of our secular society. We allow ourselves to be manipulated so that we, Jesus Christ's own disciples, are no longer in pursuit of righteousness or justice or mercy, but have been lured into the pit where we no longer risk our own lives for the sake of the undervalued, the displaced, the disenfranchised, the broken, and the hurting people of the world. When our ethics and morals and values start to model the world, then we, my brothers and sisters, are lost. There is good news, however, and that God is not putting up with this. This morning's text lets us know we are not getting off the hook. That even in the midst of modern Rome, God's kingdom of heaven is still at hand. So hear ye, hear ye, hear ye, as the town crier says, the kingdom of God is fundamentally different than the kingdom of Rome. Both yesterday's Rome and our own Rome. And our God is breaking through. When God breaks through, he shines a light on us that allows us to identify where we are in the world and how we move through transformation to faithful discipleship. So first, who are we? Well, we are gathered to people under the denomination of United Church of Christ, which is mostly white and mostly middle class. We go to church much more often than we become the church. We, over time, have allowed ourselves to become more like a 503 charity, giving extra bits of our time and money to causes, good causes, worthy causes, but not really getting involved, and that's the key. We like to keep ourselves at a safe distance, 
so there is always room between them and us. We don't really seek to understand the ins and outs, the trials and tribulations that the poor, the forgotten, the despised endure on a daily basis. We are protected by our wealth, by our affluence, by our privilege. And left to our own devices, we might just choose to remain protected in this illusion that we have created. Choosing not to see the world full of people that are not like us. But again, God's not having that. Nope. And in these four parables, he tells us how he is going to break through to us in very subversive ways. The kingdom of God is like a tiny mustard seed. It grows fast. It's a weed. It's a weed. And it's hard to get rid of weeds. But they grow to great size and they shut out the light sucking up the nutrients, starving the other plants. <clears throat> so in the Roman garden, the mustard seed chokes out the plants of greed and lust and prestige and power and sloth and all the other things that keep us from true discipleship. And it bears its own fruits of righteousness, of justice and mercy. So as Christians, Christ's disciples, no matter how badly we want to ignore the Great Commission and not think about God's love for us and his commandments, they are like a mustard seed that grows in our nice lives, continually calling us to follow Jesus and choking out our sins. The yeast is even more invasive than the mustard seed. The yeast is a microscopic it uses glucose, it grows everywhere on everything, and it changes everything. It raises flour, it ferments grain, it even decays corpses. It infects our lives. And like the Word of God infects our lives, it grows even if we don't want it to. It, um, it changes everything it touches, and God, like yeast, breaks through our twisted sense of reality and provides opportunities for our transformation. Then again, there is the kingdom of heaven is like a man who finds a treasure in the field and goes and sells all he has to buy the field. What's up with that? And what was he doing in somebody else's field digging for treasure? Is he a thief? How is the kingdom of heaven like a thief? Could it be that sometimes the only way to break through a corrupt society, a corrupt world, is to be like a thief? Is God breaking through the illusion of our world to call us to the reality of the kingdom of heaven? Is he removing those glasses that we've been talking about for weeks, the rose-colored glasses from our eyes? Is he saying, look? Is he stealing our glasses? Maybe. And how about that merchant? Now, in our time, a merchant's somewhat an innocuous label. But in Jesus' day, the merchant was kind of like the sleazy used car salesman whose motives and scruples were suspect. But here again, he sells everything he has to buy that one pearl of great price. In our world, justice is suspect. Righteousness is suspect. Mercy is suspect. Everything good is suspect. Because our world seeks corruption and doesn't want what it cannot corrupt. These parables challenge us and urge us to pay attention to our discipleship everywhere God provides reminders for us, urging us to be transformed to love God with all our heart, all our mind, and all our soul, 
and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And to let God's love transform us is to allow us to see reality as it really is, to continue to get rid of the layers and layers and layers of film that protect us from what's really out there. We can't fix things we cannot see. Remember Teresa of Avila? She says, the hearts, the hands, the feet, the compassion of Jesus are only on the earth through us right now. We are the hands, the feet, and the compassion of Jesus. So let us heed the call to discipleship and let us heed the call to transformation. And let us embrace the commandment to love God, neighbor, and self and the Beatitudes in such a way that we no longer are able to recognize ourselves as citizens of Rome, but only as citizens of the kingdom of God. Would you pray with me? Holy God, our Father and our Mother, we thank you for the things that you have given us and for the things that you have taken away. Continue to take away the lenses from our eyes that obscure the view. Help us to see the world as it really is. And help us to do your work in the world so that justice and mercy and righteousness may increase. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it's time for our prayers of the people, and I forgot to tell you when you signed in, but if you have a prayer that you would like, um, please uh, type it in on the comment section, and I'll go through it here, and I will mention it as I go. Um, oh, now Hamer Clark has another grandparent camp with two girls this time. If you need help, Hamer, just send up a SNP signal. We'll help you. Good morning, Carolyn, Mike, Vanessa, and Richmond, and Althea. Good morning, David Kerboy and family, and Sue Anderson Chaplin, and Jeannie Arsenault, and Patricia Kerboy, Francis Lamprey, it's so nice to see you this morning, and good morning, Tom and family. Uh, Barb says she would like continued prayers for Jean Miller. Surgery went well, however, tumor had grown and was in it's in soft tissue. Extensive, delicate reconstruction service surgery Monday. Uh, the long, uncertain road ahead. And he is in the DCBA hospital, not Baltimore. Okay. Karen Horton, good morning. Karen, I think the sound is on your end because no, nobody else has mentioned that. So you might have a short in your computer. Good morning, David Corkum from Vermont. How nice. Sue says she had to increase the volume from her speaker. Good morning, Eric and family and Miriam and dad. I hope you're feeling better today, dad. And good morning, Lynn. So the things that we're praying for today, we're also going to pray for my daddy at a fall yesterday. He was, he was doing the polka, you know. I'm teasing. Are there any other requests? We are going to pray for Hamer and Annie and their uh, 2.0 girl grandpa camp so that, so that they have a little energy. All right, would you pray with me? <clears throat> Holy God, we lift up the Hardy family at the passing of Sarah. <clears throat> and we lift up uh, my dad and Hamer and Annie and... Um, Barb's a friend, Jean, and we pray for all of those things in our hearts that are left unsaid but that need to be prayed for. We thank you for the joys that you have given us this week, and we come to you this morning with open hearts. 
Holy God, we do not know how to pray, <clears throat> but Jesus invites us into the life he shares with you, and we keep coming because we want to live. Receive us now in our frailty, in our complacency, our desire. We pray for the church all over the world that we would be seed and yeast where life has grown barren and heavy. May the life we discover in you bind us to each other and to the world you love, for no need is beyond the strength of your call, and no child of yours is expendable. Merciful God, give us wisdom and courage beyond our imagining. <clears throat> we pray for friends and strangers <coughs> in the grip of addiction. May us able able companions for each other and bless us now make us able companions for each other and bless us with hope that bears fruit we pray for unsettled economies and those whose needs are overlooked in the choices of the powerful may we know so much may we who know so much privilege bear our responsibilities with open hearts and open hands we pray for all who stand at the threshold of life, for your children who are soon to be born and your children who are soon to go home. We give thanks for new faces to love, ideas to ponder, work to do, and we marvel at the study of friendship and persistent memories that sustain us when the way is hard. May each be a reminder of your love and your provision. We thank you for the gift of song, for the notes that speak the words when words fail and choirs that practice at the end of long days. Give strength to leaders who call forth the best from us and invite us to breathe together. Holy One, keep calling us into the world, your world, as seed and yeast and treasure. Equip each of us for the challenges we face until we learn to worship in the most unlikely places. For you are the source of our song and the well from which we pray whenever we are planted. <clears throat> By the power of your spirit, we make our prayer with resurrection and hope. In the name of Jesus, we pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I am so glad that you joined me here this morning. So as seed and yeast willing to lose your life in the larger purposes of God, go as fisher folk and treasure seekers pouring out your days in search of hidden grace. And may God, who searches the heart, Jesus, whose love overcomes all division, and the Spirit, which helps us in our weakness, continue to lead you into life that may ser you may serve with abandoned joy. Thank you for coming. This concludes our worship service this morning. God bless each and every one of you, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.